Hello and welcome to this new gen webinar sponsored by Unchained Labs entitled See If Your Capsid Is Full of It. Easily quantify and characterize full and empty AAV. I'll be your host today. I'm Jeff Pogaliskis, the technical editor for Gen, which is coming up on its 40th year covering innovations within the life sciences industry. And today we're going to hear about two innovative machines that can help with your AAV research efforts. AAV or adeno associated virus has become the go to vector of choice for many gene therapy endeavors due to its versatility and high safety profile. Yet gathering vital information from these viral vectors, especially during the drug discovery process, can take up a significant amount of time and resources from investigators. In today's webinar, our presenters are going to tell us about two pieces of equipment from the team at Unchained Labs that are going to expedite your AAV workflows. First, the stunner system is a must have for gene therapy researchers as it can rapidly deliver critical information on genomic titer, capsid titer, and empty full ratios in a sample volume of only two microliters. Then when investigators need to test the stability of their AAV capsids, they can turn to the uncle platform, which provides new insight on AAV stability by monitoring DNA ejection from capsids, in addition to protein unfolding and aggregation. Now let's meet our presenters for today's webinar who are here to tell us more about the capabilities of these two systems. First up, we'll hear from Rafar Jean Jazil, who is the Director of Field Application Scientist at Unchained Labs. Rafar will take us through the ins and outs of the Stunner platform and how it can provide a ton of data for your AAVs from such a small sample volume. Rafar will then turn the presentation over to Dr. Kevin Lance, a marketing manager at Unchained Labs, who is going to introduce us to the capabilities of the UNCLE platform with respect to AV capsid stability. But before we begin, I want to remind the audience to stick around for the Q&A session that is going to occur right after the last presentation. To ask a question, you can send it in at any time during the presentation. Don't hesitate. All you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit Submit. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Okay, with all of the logistics out of the way, let's turn the presentation over to Rafar. Rafar, the audience is all yours. So thank you very much. And we want to thank you for joining us today. So what we're going to be focusing on is the characterization of AVs, and we're going to see exactly how our technologies can really help you gain wonderful insight and understanding into how your AV is behaving. And so the title of our talk today is See if your capsid is full of it, easily quantify and characterize full and empty AV. So I want to start with this picture of those two watermelons here. If you were to look at them, you might be tempted to say that they look about the same, right? They're about the same in size. Their appearance is generally similar. Um, and so whether you grab the one on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side, you may think that you will end up with the same experience. However, once we take a slice, <laughs> we can actually see that they are quite different, right? So if you were to have grabbed the one on the left-hand side, would have ended up with a piece of cake. And if you grab the one on the right hand side, you may have ended up with the actual fruit that you were hoping to taste. And so why is that important? Because just like viruses, just like AVs, right? It's not just the outer shell that matters. It is also what's on the inside that tells the whole story. So AAVs are a truly complex biologic, meaning that you can think of them first as a particle, right? So just a spherical component that can be characterized by size. You can also ask whether it's aggregated or not, whether it's even damaged in some cases. Um, of course, the actual capsid itself is proteinaceous. That is, it's made up of proteins. And so you can also use protein characterization techniques to begin to gain insight into how it's behaving, uh, how much of it you have, for instance, and the combination of those information gives you um, a slightly better insight into that, 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 that sample itself. And finally, of course, you have a DNA component, right? And so you have to be able to characterize that. You have to know how much of it you have or whether you have any uh, given the actual condition or the process that may have been used to derive your sample. And so all of those are really important, but as you can tell, it's a multifaceted sample. And so when it comes to characterizing them, 
the technologies that people are using are constantly evolving, right? And so really no single technique is able to give you a totality of the information that you need. But what I want to do today is show you how Stunner is able to help you derive the properties highlighted in green. And we're able to see exactly how that's a very unique approach that can give you an ensemble of properties all in one measurement. So let's focus on two technologies. On the left hand side, you have DLS or dynamic light scattering. It's a technique typically used to look at the size of samples, but also whether or not you have aggregation. When it comes to AV characterization specifically, people have also been using it to determine their capsid titer. Right? The limitation of this technology, however, is that you're not getting any DNA component. In other words, it doesn't have the ability to quantify the nucleic acid component of your sample. Conversely, on the right hand side, you have UVVIS, really well established technique, right? Very simple to use. It's ubiquitous to just about any lab. Um, and so if you're trying to quantify proteins, it's fantastic. If you're trying to quantify DNA without any dye, it's also fantastic. And because of this technology, you're able to then derive the empty to full ratio. However, you are not getting any particle information from this technology, meaning that you do not know whether or not your sample is in fact aggregated you have, in fact, no insight into whether it's even at the right size, for instance, right? And so individually, those technologies are really useful, but on their own, they simply don't give you a total picture for the actual sample that you're looking to characterize. And so we're going to see exactly how Stunner brings it all together. And what we mean by that is that with only two microliters of sample, we're going to see how this really unique and exciting platform that combines UVVs and DLS is able to give you your circle of capsid tether, your empty to full ratio, and also look at the aggregation component of your sample. All of that is possible in less than one minute per sample and no labels, reagents, or additional samples required. You simply take the sample that you have, you load it, and then you get your results. And so how exactly do we do so, right? So one part of that is the actual sample holder. And so as a user, you take two microliters, you simply pipette your sample into the input well that you see here. And then finally, that sample is going to be drawn to the microfluidic reservoir. The sample will then be read while the plate is empty. And then as your sample is then pumped into the so-called cuvette of fixed path length that you see highlighted on the right-hand side, we're going to then be able to quantify the proteinaceous component of your sample, nucleic acid component, and of course the DLS measurements as we'll see. And all of that is possible using only two microliters. Furthermore, you can actually leave your sample in the plate for up to two hours and you have no concerns about evaporation. Because each sample holder is compartmentalized, you also don't have to be concerned with cross-contamination. So it's a really unique component that gives you peace of mind and the reliability of a wonderful, precise and accurate measurement. And so two microliters, and what do we measure? UVVIS is used for the concentration of your sample. And then finally, the light scattering component are derived using both DLS and SLS, that is dynamic light scattering for the sizing and the aggregation, for instance. And then the static light scattering is used to essentially quantify the amount of light coming out of your sample. So Let's take a look at this very carefully. On the left-hand side, we have DLS and SLS, right? So DLS, as a reminder, is used to typically measure the size of your sample, and we're also looking at its composition, let's say. And so on the left-hand side, in green, you have the capsid, which is going to be the main component that we're interested in for the AV samples. And then you may also have an idea of the amount of aggregate present. And then the SLS will tell you how much signal is coming from one versus the other. On the right-hand side, you have UVVIS, and that's going to be used to determine the nucleic acid component, and then, of course, the total protein, and we'll use that to give you additional insight in your sample. So how does Stunner gets it done, as we say? So step one, we actually use the DLS to identify which of those peaks is actually your capsid, right? So as we saw previously, if you recall, capsids are typically at about 25 nanometer. And so if we see samples that are much larger or samples that are deviating from this size significantly, we know that they are aggregates and therefore they should not be used for your tighter measurements. Um, and so that's going to be the DLS component. In the middle, you have the SLS or static light scattering. And if you remember, that is purely a count or an intensity number. But what's important here is the ability to distinguish how much of that is coming from the actual capsids versus how much of that is coming from aggregate components of your sample. And the ability to distinguish them gives you even more reliable measurements and clearer insight into what's truly 
part of your title. And of course, finally, the UVVs is going to be used to give you the empty to full ratio because we can measure the protein and nucleic acid component of your sample. And so how does it look? If you look at the illustration here, the blue bar is going to be essentially your capsid. And so the dark blue specifically is a total capsid. And then the light blue is just a protein aggregate component, right? So essentially that was the gray section that we saw in the DLS peak. On the right hand side, you are going to have your total caps, full capsid here. And then the lighter green bar is going to be just the extra of free DNA present in your sample. And so if we put it all together, we begin to quantify this, right? So as a reminder, again, dark blue is your total capsid titer. The darker green is going to be your full capsid titer. And so as you can imagine, your full capsid titer over your, over your total capsid titer or divided by your total capsid titer will give you what you see on the right-hand side as your empty to full ratio components, right? And so what you're viewing in yellow is going to be the, per the percent full capsid, what you are viewing in the purple color is going to be the percent empty capsids. And finally, the empty to full ratio here, as an example, is 0 0.33. And certainly, you can see the lighter green color on the left-hand side as, green, as your free or aggregated DNA component. And then again, the lighter blue color is going to be your free and aggregated protein. And this is usually what you don't want to have in your sample. Okay. And so let's really take a look at this using some real data, right? And so in the example here, we're looking at AV5. Uh, and so we took some different laws that we had. Uh, and so if you look at that sample um, carefully, the top portion, the DLS and SLS, show you not only the green peak, which as a reminder is going to be the capsid component, and that's really what we care about, but you also are seeing in gray that there are two peaks there. So you have, of course, some aggregate that is a bit closer to your main peaks, and then you have some much larger aggregates present as the third peak that you see in the upper right hand graph and of course in the lower panel you can see the actual total protein the nucleic acid component of this sample and so how does that impact the computed results so, let's see. so here you can see that we have a much greater portion right of the blue bar that is actually lighter than the dark one and that's a reflection of the amount of aggregate present in that sample so if you recall the two gray peaks that we saw were aggregate components, and this is reflected here in this quantification. And therefore, the total capsid titer is going to be a much lower component of the total protein or total capsid titer captured in, in that sample. And finally, on the right-hand side, you can also see that the full capsid component is a much lower portion, the dark green, than the actual total bar will indicate. And then we have a significant amount of free and aggregated single-stranded DNA. But if you look at the right hand side, look what's really interesting and again very powerful about the stunner, right? Is the ability to still quantify your percent full and percent empty even in the presence of those aggregates. So we're able to say to you, yes, you have a 0.47 ratio, right, of empty to full ratio. Nonetheless, the sample isn't very clean and you may actually have perhaps the need for further purification, right? Or there may be other behavior that you see that are actually not due to your empty to full ratio, but rather to the overall quality of that sample. If we now focus on another lot, right, which was a little bit cleaner, you can actually see again here that the protein um, capsidal component is much more prominent, right? This is actually a nice green peak from the DLS. And then you can see there's a tiny bit of aggregate present. Uh, and of course, this is a real world sample, so there's going to be some aggregation present here, but again, not, you know, nothing to be worried about. And then of course, the lower panel shows you the UVVs. And so if we begin to quantify this, we can see again that the dark blue component is now much more uh, pronounced. It's a much greater proportion of the, the total bar here, which is suggesting that our sample is mostly made up of, of capsids, right? So you have less aggregate component, which is the light, lighter blue. And then of course, we can see that there's also a much greater component of full capsid titer relative to free and aggregated single stranded DNA floating in our sample. And so when we take this data and we, again, simply take dark green divided by dark blue, we're able to obtain our percent full versus empty ratio. And here you can see again that the empty to full ratio is about 0.54, right? But again, the ability to compute empty to full ratio is independent of the aggregation here, but 
to, to get reliable measurements, you do not want to essentially confound the results or overestimate the amount of your titer here. And so the precision of the titer that you see in the table on the lower left-hand corner is made, re, made um, to be more reliable because of the ability to use DLS and UVs at the same time to distinguish the, um, the true capsid versus other proteinaceous components that may have aggregated. So what if we try to trick the platform, right? And so if one were to think, well, you know, all I need is UVs, right? Or maybe all I need is DLS. Well, let's just try it and see exactly how um, Stano is able to be a bit more clever here. And so what we did in this experiment, we took some IgG and some DNA and we co-mixed them. And then on the right hand side, we put IgG alone. And as you can see, there are virtually no dark colors, right? This is mostly lighter blue and lighter green component. And if you remember the lighter blue, right, is going to be the aggregates or the non-capsid component of your sample. And the lighter green is going to be free or aggregated single stranded DNA. But again, nothing that's associated with the actual capsid titer of your sample. And so therefore, Stunner is able to easily distinguish your sample and it does not overestimate or does not necessarily give you an indication that those samples are true AEV samples. Another good proof of concept, right, is our ability to measure the empty to full ratio. And so one way to mock up this experiment is to look at the um, a mixture, right, and so this is an example that we did with AV9, where we took some empty AVs, we took some full AV samples, and then we co-mixed them in different ratio, as you can see on the x-axis, going from you know, 100 full um, sample down to 20% full to an 80% uh, empty component. And as you can see, we're able to reliably quantify those samples, but also we do so with pretty remarkable precision. And those, of course, corresponded to their empty to full ratio um, expected values. So this is, again, another proof of concept just on the reliability of this quantification method and the ease of use of Stunner. There are over 11 right, serotypes that have been identified, 11 naturally occurring serotypes for AVs, and there are a plethora of recombinant AVs being produced all the time. And so we just wanted to show you here that Stone is able to work with just about any of them. And so this is just AV5 and AV9. Uh, but so regardless of your serotype, we can essentially help you characterize them. And so we don't want you to just think that it's just for AV5 or AV9. Stone is applicable to any AV that you will bring to us. So when it comes to quantifying titers, right, let's really take a look at what's being done and how we're doing it and the added benefit of Stunner. We took some samples um, of AV9, some empty, some full, because they behave differently, right? And then we're able to then make a dilution of each of them and we're able to then compare that to the ELISA measurement of the same samples. So what I want you to realize here are a few things that are happening. First of all, the slope are very close to one. The R square values are above 0 0.99. And so really good congruence between the measurements done in Stunner versus what you may obtain by ELISA, for instance, which is great. But what I truly want you to appreciate here, right, is that the real value of Stunner is that we're able to do those measurements in less than one hour. Now, if you've ever done any ELISA measurements, you know that it can take some time, right? Those measurements can go from hours, even days, depending on how you go about doing them. Of course, you need to pro provide additional reagents, um, you know, antibodies, so on and so forth. In this case, right, it's a very simple thing to do. You pipette your samples and then you let Stunner do the rest. So in a way you set it and you forget it. But again, 64 measurements in less than one hour, something that is simply unmatched by conventional methods right now. And so Aristotle is known for having said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And as you think of this quote, I want you to really think about what Stunner really is, right? So Stunner isn't a UV-based platform. Stunner isn't simply a DLS light scattering platform, right? It is the ensemble of those two technologies which gives you the ability to do much more than the individual components that we're describing here. And so the ability to assess aggregation, the ability to quantify your capsid titer, the ability to determine how many of them are empty versus how many of them are full, the ability to look at the amount of nucleic acid component, the amount of proteinaceous component, right? And the ability to do so in two microliters in really a short amount of time is really what makes Stunner unique.
And so how does Stoner do it? Well, Stoner is label-free, sterile-free, hassle-free, and it's a gene therapy quantification platform that you need. Thanks for that introduction. So now I'll be taking a look at how you can see your capsids leak and pop with AAV genome ejection and capsid stability on uncle. If we think of AAV as a pinata, the DNA is the candy and the capsid is cardboard and colored paper, then this is what a thermal stability experiment looks like. Uncle is the broadsword wielding warrior who is wasting no time seeing what this capsid can withstand. Meanwhile, gene therapy researchers are there in that background, cheering on the experiment and excited for the results. And in the world of viruses, lots can go wrong. Uh, but in viral stability, let's look closer at two questions, aggregation and virus capsid stability. Knowing the answer to these questions is key to optimizing capsid design, formulations, process and storage conditions, uh, since you want to del deliver an answer that will keep your virus in the best possible condition for the longest time possible. You could also ask if stability problems are the underlying reasons for potency, purity, or immunogenicity issues. And current techniques for answering these stability questions take time and sometimes a lot of sample. Uh, functional uh, assays like infectivity and potency uh, require highly skilled personnel working through time-consuming cell-based assays. So there is a real need to get data on viral stability in a few hours with low sample requirements to quicken the development process and simplify the required assays. That's where UNCLE comes in. UNCLE is an all-in-one stability platform built for biologics. It uses two lasers to excite either label-free protein intrinsic fluorescence or a variety of dye-based fluorescences. With full-spectrum fluorescence detection, UNCLE can pick up both kinds of signal. SLS is the scattered light from those two lasers, and it gives information on when aggregates form. DLS is dynamic light scattering and allows for detailed measurements of size and size distribution. These three detection methods can be operated isothermally or across a heat ramp designed to thermally stress samples and see which ones can take the heat. So UNCLE is able to deliver results on aggregation and two different looks at viral capsid stability in about two hours with only nine microliters of sample for up to 48 samples at a time. So the uni is what makes all this possible and what makes the UNCLE truly unique, providing that high throughput and small sample size that I've mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a uni which has 16 uh, quartz cubit wells in each uh, aluminum frame. Each well holds that nine microliter sample volume. And then those unis are then sealed in this blue frame between silicone seals, which means that evaporation is not a problem during a thermal ramp or an isothermal run. And then all, all you do is you load your uh, uni inside its blue frame onto the Peltier plate of the uncle, this copper surface. Uh, that's what we do in the heating of your sample. And that's how you run anywhere from one up to 48 samples at a time and any unused wells of your uni you can use later on. So with AAVs on UNCLE, fluorescence can be used to measure two different behaviors for capsid stability, either burst on the left, uh, protein unfolding and capsid disruption occurring as a result, or second in the bottom left, genome ejection occurring from capsids. We'll look at data both from the literature and UNCLE to demonstrate those behaviors. With UNCLE's SLS and DLS capabilities, we will also be able to identify when aggregation occurs, either at time zero, before an experiment, or during a thermal ramp. So the first question to address is, how do we know that AAV capsids have two different options for stability issues? Here we can see both stability behaviors directly using AFM data generated by Bruneau. In this case, we have AAV serotypes eight or nine uh, and we're doing AFM as they're being heated. At the top of the slide in the purple box, we can see intact AAV capsid, which is shown as the white disc by an AFM measurement. Uh, as those samples are heated, two different morphologies emerge. Uh, in the middle, there is a ejected DNA morphology, where DNA is ejected as a single strand uh, coming out of the intact capsids, and it becomes linearized, linearized, and it can be detected as free-floating linearized uh, SSDNA later through the AFM. And at the bottom is the other morphology where intact capsids burst and they leave behind a complex tangled pile of compact DNA. Uh, this would be the uh, capsid disruption pathway uh, seen from the previous slide. So how can UNCLE figure out stability along those two different pathways? Well, first let's take a look at UNCLE's intrinsic fluorescence uh, 
uh, where it's going to use its 266 nanometer laser and track the fluorescence of tryptophan and tyrosine residues inside of the actual uh, proteins of the AAV capsid. So here we have a quick look at the intrinsic fluorescence signal collected by UNCLE on a sample of 1E13 AAV9 without cybergold. Each line is a fluorescence read at a different temperature. As the sample temperature increases, the signal intensity drops and shifts to the right, called a redshift. The blue arrow is meant to guide the eye to this shift, helped by the dashed blue line showing the true vertical. Also note that you can see the SLS signal from both 266 and 473 nanometer lasers. Here we're looking at the results of one of those intrinsic fluorescence experiments over a thermal ramp. What we're looking at along the y-axis is the BCM, or barycentric mean wavelength. This is basically the center of mass uh, wavelength for the spectra that we saw in the previous slide. As we heat up this sample, that BCM wavelength, or center of mass, uh, increases to higher wavelengths, which is happening from the protein's redshift. Where this uh, change starts to occur, we have called a T-onset, and where there's an inflection point in this change, we called a melting temperature. So this is an, now this is showing us where the AV capsid proteins are unfolding, and this is done on a sample of uh, 1E13 VG per mil AAV9, uh, but can be done on a sample as low as 5E12 VG per mil. If we take that same intrinsic fluorescence data and overlay the SLS data from the 266 nanometer laser, we see here aggregation behavior with the TAG aggregation temperature at 74.5 degrees Celsius. So what this is telling us is the onset temperature of unfolding, shown in blue, and the onset temperature of aggregation, shown in green, occur at the same uh, time, indicating that the capsid unfolding ties very closely with the aggregation in this experiment. Taking a look at other serotypes, we can also connect that data back to the results from literature. Here we have the results of an intrinsic fluorescence thermal ramp with AAV serotypes 1, 2, and 9. The intrinsic fluorescence shows the difference in behavior across serotypes and pairs up with the results uh, that we see from Bennett nicely, even though they're using a different assay relying on separate orange at a much higher concentration. To track genome ejection, the other stability pathway, Uncle will excite cybergold dye with its 473 nanometer laser and use that dye to detect when genome ejection occurs. Uh, this happens because at the start, cybergold has low fluorescence while AAV genomes are safely tucked away inside of capsids, uh, but any free DNA will fluoresce in the will, will cause cybergold to fluoresce. However, when the capsid is heated and releases DNA, uh, DNA will extrude out through the capsid, as we saw in this linearized DNA from the AFM images earlier, and cybergold will bind and increase its fluorescence signal. Uh, so the temperature where the dye fluorescence increases will be our stability readout. So here we're looking at the raw uh, fluorescence results from a sample of 1E13 AAV9 with cybergold, where we can see the dye's fluorescence in a different part of the spectrum between about 500 and 650 nanometers. We also see the SLS peak at 473 nanometers. In this experiment, only the 473 nanometer laser is used, so that's why there's no intrinsic fluorescence or SLS signal at 266. In this case, we'll be tracking the uh, area under the curve uh, for the cybergold fluorescence. Here's a look at the results for that cybergold fluorescence experiment. Uh, the start happens at about 25 degrees Celsius, where we have initial fluorescence read, indicating how much DNA is present free floating around the capsids. As we increase the temperature, the fluorescence of cybergold decreases because there is a relationship between temperature and cybergold fluorescence, something easily seen in controls if we want to look at it. However, the headline of this experiment starts at about 50 degrees Celsius it increases until about 58 degrees Celsius, where we see a melting temperature. Uh, this is coming from DNA ejection coming out of AAV capsids. That ejection continues until about 75 degrees Celsius, where we know that capsid proteins unfold, aggregation occurs, and sort of chaos reigns. Then again, at the end of the experiment, uh, after the temperature is reached 95 degrees Celsius, Uncle will actually lower the temperature back to 25 and take another fluorescence read to get a picture of how much uh, DNA has been released in total. This kind of experiment here was done at, uh, with 1E13 VG per mil AAV9, but because the fluorescence detection uh, using the dye is so sensitive, it actually has a dynamic range from 5 times 10 to the 11th all the way up to and past 1 times 10 to the 14th VG per mil. 
So that's a look at how you can get information on DNA release uh, and free DNA around AAV, along with capset aggregation in just one experiment. If we change the concentration of AAV9 across the dynamic range, you can see that uh, you have a consistent genome ejection uh, where the melting temperature does not vary across a wide range. And interestingly, if we change the percent full instead of changing the concentration, the behavior looks very, very similarly, where the melting temperature uh, remains pretty consistent, and which is shown by the inset. And as we go from 100% fulls to 75% full, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the behavior looks very similarly to if we were uh, decreasing the concentration of the sample. So even though they have the same caps of titer and we're varying the percent full, the number of full AAV particles in the sample is also decreasing, just like we saw on the previous slide. If we want to look at a few more serotypes by genome ejection, uh, here we have PHP.EB on the left of the slide and Ancient 80 on the right of the slide. In each case, the fluorescence readout by uh, cybergold fluorescence is shown in green and the uh, SLS473 readout is shown in blue. So I chose these two serotypes uh, in particular because they represent the extreme ends of what's possible for genome ejection uh, seen on the uncle. On the left, PHP.EB is actually the only serotype that I've ever seen where genome ejection and aggregation behavior align at the same time. So this is indicating that genome ejection is not occurring uh, prior to capsid unfolding and aggregation, uh, but actually genome ejection and, and aggregation are occurring all at, at once, uh, possibly triggered by the same phenomenon. Meanwhile, with ancient 80 on the right of the slide, what we're actually seeing is a 30 degree difference between genome ejection by cybergold and aggregation by SLS473, which is the largest of any serotype that we've seen. And, and the other serotypes tested, uh, which I believe at this point counts one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, all those behaviors differ depending on which serotype you're looking at. And that can include both genome ejection, as well as if that behavior has one melting temperature or two melting temperatures. And beyond serotypes, excipients also impact uh, genome injection behavior and capsid unfolding behavior. So on the left of this slide, what we're looking at is a read of AAV stability uh, based on intrinsic fluorescence. So here we're looking at the capsid stability and the protein fluorescence. So in green, we have AAV9 in a PBS buffer, and in blue, where we spiked in a high concentration of arginine, you see a decrease in the melting temperature, indicating that in the presence of arginine, these capsids are less stable. On the right side of the slide, we're looking at a cybergold fluorescence readout, uh, where we're tracking genome ejection. And in this case, we see a similar phenomenon, where in PBS, we get a melting temperature of about 58 degrees Celsius, and we spike in a high concentration of arginine, genome ejection behavior is changed to a lower temperature, indicating a less stable capsid. So let's one look at how excipients can impact uh, behaviors of your AAV. And we also know that uh, other variables such as pH can strongly impact both capsid stability and genome ejection. So kind of in summary, uh, when we're thinking about melting temperatures of capsids, generally when we're thinking about capsid disruption, those occur above about 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, for most serotypes, especially naturally occurring serotypes that we see from AAVs 1 through 9. And then genome ejection behaviors generally occur before those capsid disruption events, uh, so that your AAV is actually losing its uh, genome somewhere in the 40 to 7 degrees Celsius range, well before capsids have been disrupted from protein unfolding. So once we've used UNCLE to crack open the AAV pinata, uh, now I want to show you what other benefits using UNCLE to attack those, you know, pinatas can offer. So as I mentioned previously, since we're getting an initial fluorescence read of uh, from cybergold based on how much DNA is present outside of AAV capsids, we can use fluorescence to track DNA levels. So that's kind of illustrated on the left side of the slide. And on the right, what we're doing is we're graphing that uh, fluorescence area uh, which represents the initial amount of free DNA as a function of capsid titer. So naturally, these are just dilution series, and you'd expect that those would be extremely linear, which we see, uh, and that the precision is actually uh, pretty good. So we have all results you know, below about 4% CV for all samples in this series. 
And if we go take a look at the total amount of DNA released from a, melting, uh, from a thermal stability experiment, where we see AAV that are, that are kind of popping open, uh, again, through this dilution series across a range of four different concentrations, we get a very, very linear uh, result where the fluorescence area of cybergold tracks extremely well with the concentration of AAV that we used. And again, the precision of this is quite excellent with a CV you know, about five and a half percent or lower for all samples. And uh, we didn't focus on it too much in this talk, but with UNCLE's DLS, you can also get an understanding of AAV size and aggregation uh, done both before and after thermal ramp. So in this case, we're seeing at 25 degrees Celsius, uh, an average size on UNCLE for this AAV of about 28.7 nanometers. And that's also a monodispersed peak. So there's no other aggregate peaks shown with our, our blue read at 25 degrees Celsius, indicating this is a very nice monodispersed, uh, good quality AAV sample. And we should you know, trust that we're doing this experiment from a sample that's in good shape. Likewise, after a thermal stability run at 95 degrees Celsius, we can do DLS again and confirm that aggregation has occurred. And this will work on UNCLE uh, down to a lower limit of about 5 times 10 to the 11th VG per mil. So that's a look at how we can see more AAV stability behavior with UNCLE. Using UNCLE's two lasers and full spectrum fluorescence, we're able to take a look at both pathways of AAV stability, the genome ejection and the capsid disruption pathway. Its DLS was able to look at sample quality before a thermal ramp and was able to provide another quantitative measure of aggregation after a thermal ramp. And its cybergold fluorescence metric was a useful tool to look at DNA uh, when it was free floating prior to thermal ramp or the total amount of DNA released from your, your AAV sample after a thermal ramp. And importantly, most of this information actually is available in only one experiment using only one nine microliter volume of sample. So now with all this uncle data, uh, you can create an AAV that's ready for battle and won't aggregate or fall apart when under stress. So now I believe Rafar and I are excited to answer any questions. And so I'll ask, uh, what questions do you have for us? Kevin, Rafar? Great presentations and some really nice insight in two platform technologies that all AAV researchers should not be without. We thank you for that. To the audience, the Q&A is going to begin very soon. And I want to just remind everyone, if you have questions for Kevin and Rafar, don't hesitate. Send them in. All you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit Submit. All right, since we have a bunch of questions already, let's get to the Q&A. Bear with us for just a moment as we transition into the Q&A session. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for the Q&A session. We have a bunch of questions for our gentleman here. Uh, Rafar, first question is gonna be for you. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know, can other instruments give me this information um, if I do DLS and UV Viz separately? Are you with us? Maybe you're on mute. Sorry, Jeff? That's right. Yep, there you go. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, yes, so no the answer to that question is no, right? And and the reason for it is because essentially the standard. Yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Uh, I am not... Yep, we can hear you. Yep. Okay, there's a slight. Okay, there's a slight delay here. Okay, so I'll start over. So, apologize. So, the answer to the question is no, um, and, and the reason for it is because the the the, Lewis, the stoner right combines UVs and DLS, but the application itself actually relies on the both technologies at once to inform the answers to both questions. Um, and so, essentially, if someone is interested in replicating this using a separate UVs and a separate DLS platform, uh, that is simply not possible. Uh, so they will need to right. to essentially use the stunner because it, it has the convolution software there's a database behind the scenes but also it's pulling data from both detectors to inform the results presented all right great thanks for mm -hmm. uh kevin we have a question for you um can cyber gold be used to assess the mechanism of genome injection uh, yeah, so the idea with looking at cyber gold to understand uh, genome injection is basically to distinguish whether this is going to be genome ejection kind of linearly from the capsids or genome ejection that is the result of the, the capsids unfolding. Um, and because UNCLE is able to look at 
different behaviors, you know, protein behaviors and uh, you know, DNA behavior independently, then using that dye is a good way to understand if those two uh, you know, different ways of genome ejection happen from totally different temperatures or, or not. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty good way of understanding if genomes are coming out of your capsids at much lower temperature, uh, you know, as a result of formulation or capsid sequence, or at much higher uh, temperatures as a result of total capsid failure. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Rafar, back to you. Um, are the capsids you analyze purified? Uh, presuming uh, they necessarily are to some extent, can you tell us the method you use? Was it benzenase treatment or uh, cesium chloride gradient? Uh, yes, so they were purified, just not by us, right? So I think as we presented them, the data that we collected was used as received from our vendors. Uh, but from our vendor, they were purified using cesium chloride, um, iodixanol, uh, some benzenase in some cases. But again, once we receive them, we basically use them as as they were sent to us. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question actually is going to be for both of you guys. So before you can stay with me, I'll ask you first. Uh, first part is what prep did? Uh, sorry, what sample prep do I need uh, to do for the stunner? And then what sample prep uh, is required for Uncle? So Rafar, if you want to start off. Sure. So it's a good follow-up to the previous question. Uh, so ultimately, you just need two microliter of sample, right? So to some extent, if your sample is relatively purified, so you've gone through your anion exchange, um, you can begin using the stunner. Uh, and so really just low two microliter, there isn't any reagent required. There's no primer, for instance. There's no dye required, right? So you can simply load uh, and then just begin the experiment. Yeah, and then for uncle, uh, all you need is to be able to get above that lower limit of detection, which is about five times 10 to the 11th VG per mil for the cyber gold assay. Uh, and then you add in uh, some cyber gold and that's that's all you need. It's just adding the cyber gold to your sample. All right, great, thank you. Um, so far, a question for you. Uh, an audience member says, maybe I missed this, but um, how do you tell from aggregate and UViz which capsids are full? What is the what is the equation? That's a great question. Yes. <laughs> so the equation is a secret sauce, but the way we go about doing so essentially relies on one principle or one observation, which is that empty capsids scatter light differently than full capsids. And so while we're able to measure using UVVs the concentration of uh, proteinaceous components in your sample, we can also measure, of course, the nucleic acid. So in this case, single stranded DNA present in the sample. The ability to actually determine whether the capsids are full or empty relies on the way they scatter light. And so we went out and we measured, um, you know, a bunch of empty capsids essentially and a bunch of full capsids. We have a very well determined profile of how they should be behaving. We also have their sequence, uh, so on and so forth. And again, the ensemble of those uh, data essentially come together to inform us whether they're full or empty. All right, and one more question for you, Rafar. Uh, mm -hmm. How does Scudder compare to getting a titer by qPCR? It's a question, yes. So there are a few ways to approach that question. Um, so if you're asking purely in terms of how do the numbers compare, uh, they are comparable. And we've done some work to essentially establish that um, our numbers are reliable. Certainly, there are different technologies. So there may be differences here and there. But for the most part, you are going to have pretty solid congruence between the two, the two measurements. And, and we've seen that. Uh, in terms of how one goes about actually collecting the data, in terms of that difference, right? So from a methodology standpoint, again, if you're doing qPCR, you're going to require some primer. You may, in some cases, use a kit. Your sample volume may actually vary based on the kit that you're using and the actual plate, right? So whether you're going from a 384 plate or a smaller capacity or higher capacity, the volumes can range from anything, typically what we saw from five up to 20 microliter in most common cases. If you're using stunner, you're going to simply need two microliter and that's it, right? And that's going to be the same thing every single time, irrespective of the serotype, irrespective of the number of samples that you want to, to characterize. And, and so in terms of um, how do we compare, simpler workflow, but just as reliable results. And again, we can do those measurements in about one minute per sample, as opposed to, you know, the many hours that a, a qPCR run can take. All right, great. Uh, Kevin, question for you. Um, does testing melting temperature using cyber gold correlate with changes to functional performance? Yeah, so there's a small uh, body of literature that suggests that yes, it does. Uh, there's publications uh, both in actually a recent Nature paper as well as uh, publications at other conferences 
uh, that say that yes, uh, melting temperature by cyber gold does correlate to functional assays. All right, great. And Rafar, I think we're back to you again. Um, can I put several serotypes on one plate on the stunner? You absolutely can, yeah. It's actually one of the things that we like the most about the software and the way it's configured is that it's essentially simple independent, right? So you can load as many serotypes as you can, and you can either use an import template, just like an Excel template, to basically inform the software where your samples are and which samples are located there. Um, or you can simply use the user interface built in the software to select the actual serotype that you want, including the buffer and other relevant uh, information that you may want to add there. And so that can allow you to run as many different serotypes as you can. Um, just a small note on the actual throughput, right? So we can actually run as many as 96 samples per plate. As many as 10 plates can be run per experiment. So you could, in theory, run 960 different samples uh, in an experiment if you wanted to. And again, irrespective of the serotype and where you put it on the plate, we can certainly handle that without you know, much involvement from the user. Great, and we have a question for Kevin. Kevin, um, can you describe your viral particle production system, uh, the cell type and the MOI of the initial transduction, uh, the time of the particle harvest? Is it 48 hours? So yeah, that's a good question. As Rafar mentioned earlier, um, we did use up to you know, four different vendors for these kinds of AAV studies. Uh, they used a variety of purification methods and production methods, um, baculobires, and uh, HEC-293 was used, uh, cesium chloride, spins, uh, idixinol spins, and chromatographic purification were all used uh, during development of, of both of these uh, applications. So it's, the answer is, uh, Kind of yes to everything, I would say. Um, Rafar, back to you. Since particles contain both uh, positive and negative uh, strands, single-stranded DNA, um, is the 100% duplex DNA formed by annealing of opposite strands actually the source of the aggregated DNA? Yes, that, that's part of it. Uh, it's, it's not just what we saw, but it's part of it, certainly, right? That will be one component, uh, but you certainly will need to reach a certain size to be able to distinguish that uh, from the main peak that we're using to, to determine where the capsid is. Uh, but there are other, also other components. So if you have any proteinaceous, you know, free proteins floating around and they could mix with the DNA, for instance, that's going to essentially be part of the aggregate component. Uh, we use the, the word aggregate very loosely, but we really mean any additional particle that is large enough in size to, to be distinguished from your main capsid. All right, and then a follow-up to that, is the stunner instrument sensitive uh, to a doxanol? Uh, if we use a doxanol for purification process, how do you recommend removing it from the sample? Uh, yes, so you can use it, right, up to a certain concentration. Certainly, you have some absorbance concerns there, uh, but the software itself actually does some deconvolution, and so we're able to fit what we, 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 we assess nucleic acid DNA to be, right, um, and then any deviation from that let's say, ideal morphology of your curve uh, can inform us that there are impurities and the software will essentially subtract that out and it will not be factored in your concentration calculation. All right, great. Um, Kevin, back to you. Um, have you assessed the capabilities of the stunner with different viral genome sizes with respect to titer and packaging efficiency? Uh, yeah, so I can, I can take this one. So this is basically a question of can you adjust how stunner you know, calculates its its answers uh, using different viral genome si uh, sizes, and that's uh, that is yes. Uh, one of the inputs that you input into Stunner is just the length of viral genome. Uh, so based on that, Stunner will uh, do the calculations differently when it's figuring out all of its uh, viral genome titers. All right, and we have another one for you, Kevin. Um, regarding uh, AAV aggregation, uh, does it naturally aggregate in PBS? Um, how long can it take to reach 10% or 50% aggregation at 25 degrees? And then lastly, um, are there, is that serotype dependent? Yeah, so aggregation is definitely a major problem for a lot of AAV serotypes. Uh, it, Depends on the serotype, how fastly it aggregates, but we do tend to see aggregation uh, in every buffer, including PBS. Um, I, I know one of my favorites is AAV9, since it tends to stay stable very quickly, and AAV5, by contrast, uh, shows aggregation problems pretty quickly. Um, 
And then in terms of measuring that, uh, that's something that both Uncle and Stunner can do via DLS to see when aggregation becomes a problem. And then it can also help you understand the effect of formulation on that aggregation rate, um, because it definitely depends both on formulation and serotype. All right, great. Um, Rafar, back to you, another question. Um, so how do you extract data from overlapping peaks uh, in DLS measurements? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so most people who use DLS are aware that DLS has some resolution um, limitations, right? Meaning that samples are not 3x different in size, may appear to be essentially either overlapping or they may appear to be like twin peaks that are very close to each other. And so because we actually know your serotype um, and we know the expected size for that sample um, and other bits of information that we have, we're able to essentially compartmentalize what should be the capsid peak versus what may be just smaller order oligomers that are very close to it. And that allows us to distinguish your main um, capsid peak from other components which may be near, near that one. All right, great. And we have another one for you, Rafar. Um, is this methodology virus specific or can it be modified for VLPs constructed from other gag proteins? Uh, yes, it, it can. Uh, and so it is not AV specific. Um, it works for viruses, but it also works for VLPs um, and even LNPs, technically. Um, and, and so it, it does have some flexibility, right? So we have the ability to certainly assess their size. We have the ability to assess whether aggregates are detected. And if there are any components which can absorb light, we can certainly assess whether or not um, there are concentrations worth um, you know, computing and all of that information will be available to the user. So you have some flexibility. That platform isn't limited to just AVs or viruses. We can use it certainly for analogous uh, particles as well. All right, great. And it looks like we have time for one more question, uh, which I think is going to be for both of you guys. Um, do the systems, do these systems have 21 uh, CFRP11 software? Uh, yes, they do. So, and I think, you know, either one of us can answer that question, but certainly they do. Yes. So the standard itself has 21 CFR Part 11 compliance already available, uh, and you'll simply you know, have to update the key for it. Uh, and then along with that comes all of the necessary you know, tests that you will need. So IQQ, there are other you know, system stability tests available for the user and other performance verifications and PQs that can also be made available to you. And then for the uncle, it's more or less the same thing. There's 21 CFR Part 11 uh, compliance as well that can be turned on. And the same thing here can be done. We can do PVs and IQQs for that system as well. So if they have to be placed in a regulated environment, that, that can be done, absolutely. All right, great, thank you, gentlemen. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website for up to a year. That's at genengineers.com. Uh, so if you've missed any parts of it, you can watch it again, or feel free to send the link to any of your friends or colleagues who you think might be interested. Uh, I'd like to thank Rafar and Kevin for their very informative presentations, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Unchained Labs for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully we'll see you again in another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone.